Okay, imagine this. Um, you're out with friends in Kigali, right? Yeah. Having a good time, mm -hmm. drinks, snacks, the whole thing. And at the end of the night, you can pay for everything. And I mean everything, even a cab ride home with just a single 1,000 Rwandan franc note. Wow. Pretty incredible, yeah, huh? That's amazing. Well, that was actually the reality back in the 1980s. Really? According to this article about living costs in Rwandan cities that you sent us. Oh, wow. Okay. Obviously, today things are a little different. Yeah, I imagine so. So we're going to be diving deep right into Kigali's housing market. Okay. How it's transformed over the years, the range of options you have today. I mean, we're talking from the super basic to the super luxurious. Got it. What it all says about, well, the city's journey. Sounds fascinating. This article, it starts with this, well, mind-blowing comparison. Okay. It says that back in the late 1980s, a company director, you know, someone well off, mm -hmm. they were earning around 60,000 Rwandan francs a month. Okay. And get this, a beer, just 100 francs. Wow, so affordable. Can you imagine? No, not at all. It really paints a picture of just how affordable things used to be. It really highlights how much Rwanda's economy has grown since then. Right. And that growth, especially in Kigali, has undeniably impacted the cost of living. Absolutely. What was once easy to afford for most has, well, become a real challenge for many. It's pretty amazing um, how much can change in just a few decades. Yeah, yeah, it's incredible. This article goes on to say that Kigali's housing market today is just incredibly diverse. Okay. Catering to, well, different budgets, but with like drastically different living conditions, yeah. obviously depending on what you can afford. Right. It's almost like different worlds kind of existing okay. side by side. You can definitely see that reflected in the different types of neighborhoods that have sprung up. Yeah. The article breaks them down into three categories. Uh, Premium, medium, and low income. Got it. Each one offers a distinct lifestyle and of course comes with a very different price tag. Makes sense. So let's start with those premium neighborhoods. Okay. The ones where, well, Kigali's elite reside. Right. Places like uh, Kasiru, Kiovu, and Kimihura. Mm -hmm. Alongside some newer developments, uh, like Narudurama, Gakaliro, and Kibagabaga. Interesting. It sounds like, well, a mix of established and... Uh, up and coming areas. That's right. These neighborhoods are known for their upscale planning, proximity to the central business district, and of course, those luxurious properties. Of course. Think, you know, manicured lawns, modern architecture, and a certain exclusivity. And speaking of those luxurious properties, yeah. the article talks about these massive villas in these high end areas right. that can have up to 10 bedrooms, wow. swimming pools, private playgrounds. It's almost hard to grasp the scale. It's a level of luxury that really reflects the economic boom Kigali has experienced. I bet. These villas often sit on plots of land ranging from 1,000 to 5,000 square meters. Wow. With prices reaching, well, 800 million to 1.2 billion Rwandan francs. Okay, that's an astronomical figure. Yeah. I mean, I can only <laughs> imagine the kind of lifestyle that comes with living in one of these places. Right. But let's say you're not looking to buy just rent in these uh, exclusive neighborhoods. Okay. What kind of prices are we talking about then? Even renting in these areas requires a substantial budget. Yeah. A luxury villa could set you back anywhere from 4 million to 11 million francs per month. Wow. And if a villa isn't your style, there are exclusive apartments like La Rue Bibi in Yarutarama or Touch Africa in Kasiyuru. Okay. Those will cost you between 1 million and 3.5 million francs per month in rent. So even renting in these premium neighborhoods is a far cry from those uh, 100 franc beers of the past. Definitely. It makes you wonder how those prices relate to, well, the average income in Kigali today. That's a really important point. Yeah. While these luxury properties really showcase Kigali's economic progress, right. they also highlight the growing disparity between the city's wealthiest residents and those with more modest incomes. So it's not just about, like, the changing landscape of the city, but also the changing demographics of who can actually afford to live in these different areas. That's very true. It seems like Igali is becoming a city with, well, distinct tiers of affordability. That's an insightful observation. Yeah. And it leads us to the question of what options are available for those who, well, don't fall into that high income bracket. Exactly. What does the article say about those medium income neighborhoods? Well, it seems like places like Kimaranko, Kikukiro, Kaigarama, and Rusoro offer a more accessible yet still comfortable lifestyle. Oh. They might be a bit further from the city center, but the article highlights their 
uh, well-developed roads and planned layouts. Exactly. These neighborhoods attract a mix of residents, from young professionals to families, mm. drawn to their balance of, well, affordability and convenience. So we're moving away from those million franc monthly rents. Yes. What kind of numbers are we looking at in these uh, medium income areas? The article mentions Ribeiro as an example. Mm. Rents there can range from 1 million to 3 million francs per month. Mm -hmm. And purchasing a house could cost, well, between 150 million and 250 million francs. Okay. However, it's worth noting that even within these neighborhoods, there's a mix of properties. Right. With some high-end homes fetching prices as high as uh, 800,000 US dollars. So even within these so-called medium income areas, mm -hmm. there's still a spectrum of affordability. Yes. With some properties catering to, well, a higher income bracket. Right. It's interesting how those uh, different worlds continue to intersect. It speaks to the dynamism of Kigali's housing market, how it's constantly evolving and responding to the city's growth and changing demographics. Yeah. But it also raises questions about accessibility for those with, well, more limited budgets. Absolutely. Speaking of which, what about those who are really feeling the squeeze of uh, rising costs? Mm -hmm. What does the article say about housing in Kigali's uh, low-income neighborhoods? Those are the areas where affordability becomes the primary concern. The article mentions places like Gatsata, Kimisagara, Masaka, and Ayabaraya as examples. Got it. These neighborhoods often lack the um, modern amenities and planned layouts of the more affluent areas, right. but offer the most accessible entry point into the city's housing market. So while these neighborhoods might not have the same level of um, development, yeah. they play a crucial role in providing housing for, well, a large segment of Kigali's population. Absolutely. What kind of rents are we talking about in these areas? The article mentions that a basic one-bedroom unit in these neighborhoods could rent for as low as 30,000 francs a month. Okay, that's a striking difference compared to those million franc apartments we were talking about earlier. But I imagine there's a range even within these low income areas, right? Absolutely. Yeah. Depending on the specific location and condition of the property, you might be looking at rents closer to 80,000 francs for a one bedroom unit. Okay. Two bedroom homes typically rent for between 100,000 and 200,000 francs. It's still significantly more affordable than the other areas we've discussed, but for many residents, even these costs can be a stretch. It highlights the challenges uh, that many people face in finding affordable housing in a city experiencing, well, rapid growth and development. For sure. What about um, buying a property in these uh, low-income neighborhoods? Is that a possibility? It is, but you won't find those uh, sprawling villas here. Right. A basic house might cost around 60 million to 70 million francs. Okay. If you're looking for something larger, like a um, multi-story building, yeah. you might be looking at 150 million to 180 million francs. It sounds like even in the most affordable areas of Kigali, the cost of housing represents uh, a significant investment. It does. And I can't help but think back to that um, company director from the 1980s earning 60,000 francs a month. Yeah. It makes you wonder how incomes have kept pace with these uh, rising housing costs. It's a complex issue, and it's a concern that the National Bank of Rwanda is trying to address. The article mentions their efforts to discourage landlords from renting out high-end properties in U.S. dollars, okay. pushing for transactions to be conducted in Rwandan francs instead. That's an interesting detail. Yeah. What's the uh, rationale behind that? Well, imagine you're a Rwandan earning Rwandan francs. Yeah. And the rent for your apartment is quoted in U.S. dollars. Okay. As the exchange rate fluctuates, your rent could essentially increase overnight. Wow. Making it incredibly difficult to budget and potentially pushing housing out of reach. That sounds like a recipe for um, instability, especially for those who are already struggling to make ends meet. Exactly. Yeah. By encouraging the use of Rwandan francs, the National Bank is trying to create a more stable and equitable housing market. Okay. One where costs are, well, predictable and accessible to a wider range of residents. It's like they're trying to level the playing field, you know? Mm hmm. Recognizing that. While economic growth is important, it needs to be accompanied by policies that um, protect the most vulnerable. It's a balancing act. Yeah. And it highlights the importance of considering the uh, social impact of economic policies. Absolutely. Especially in a city like Kigali that's experiencing such rapid transformation. It seems like Kigali's housing market 
really reflects the uh, broader economic realities of its residents, right? With options for you know various income levels, mm -hmm. but also a stark reminder of the disparities that exist. It does. But let's shift gears for a moment and look beyond Kigali. Okay. The article also touches on housing costs in Rwanda's uh, secondary cities, right? Yes, and it might surprise you to learn that housing in some of these cities is considerably more affordable than in Kigali. Oh, okay. It's a whole different landscape with its own um, unique dynamics. Okay, now I'm intrigued. Tell me more about these uh, secondary cities and how their housing markets compare. Well, let's start with Muhanga. Okay. It's a city where housing is still relatively accessible. Got it. You could find a single room for rent for around 50,000 francs per month. Okay. Larger homes might rent for around 200,000 francs. And even a um, high-end standalone house might only cost you 300,000 francs per month to rent. Wow, that's a fraction of what you'd find in Kigali. Yeah. What factors contribute to housing being so much more um, affordable in Muhanga? One key reason is access to local construction materials like sand and bricks. Yeah. This keeps building costs down, which in turn affects rental and purchase prices. Right. It's a reminder that the availability of resources plays a significant role in shaping uh, housing affordability. That makes sense. So if someone is looking for a more affordable place to live in Rwanda, Mohanga might be a good option to explore. It could be. But I imagine each of these secondary cities has its own um, unique character and its own set of pros and cons, right? Absolutely. Yeah. They each offer a different pace of life, different amenities and different opportunities. Right. For instance, the article mentions Musanze, okay. which is known for its stunning natural beauty and its growing tourism industry. That's right. Musanze is famous for its proximity to uh, Volcanoes National Park, where you can trek to see gorillas in their natural habitat. An amazing experience. It's become a popular destination for both uh, domestic and international tourists. How has that um, tourism boom impacted housing costs in Musanze. Musanze presents an intriguing contrast. Okay. It's a city where you find both affordable homes and, well, luxury hotels catering to tourists with uh, deep pockets. Okay, now I'm really curious. Give me some specific examples of what those um, costs look like. Well, on the more affordable end, you could find basic homes renting for between 60,000 and 120,000 francs per month. Okay. Family homes might be in the 200,000 to 300,000 franc range, mm -hmm. but then you have those luxury hotels offering five-star accommodations, yeah. breathtaking views, and amenities designed for, well, a high-end experience. Right. These hotels can charge anywhere from 50,000 to 200,000 francs like this per night. Wait, per night? Per night. So you could literally live in a modest home for a whole month for the cost of a single night in one of these uh, luxury hotels. That's right. That's a pretty stark illustration of the um, economic disparities at play. It certainly highlights the uh, dual nature of Musanzi's housing market. Yeah. Catering to both budget conscious travelers and those seeking a more, well, lavish experience. Right. And it gets even more extreme. Really? The article mentions some of those luxury hotels can cost as much as 20 million francs per night. 20 million for one night. Yes. That's mind boggling. It is. You could buy a house for that price in many parts of Rwanda. You could buy several houses for that amount in some areas. Right. It's a stark reminder of the spending power of, well, certain tourists and the impact that can have on uh, local economies. It definitely paints a picture of a city navigating the complexities of a growing tourism industry. Sure. Trying to balance the needs of its residents with the demands of a um, high-end market. It is a delicate balancing act. What about the other secondary cities mentioned in the article? Did it um, touch upon any others? It did. It briefly mentioned Bugisera and Hyuye, each with their own unique factors influencing their um, housing markets. Okay, let's start with Bugisera. What's happening there? Bugisera is experiencing a surge in interest due to the construction of a new airport. Oh, okay. This is attracting new residents and investors. Right. And that, of course, is having an impact on housing costs. So it sounds like Bukasera is on the cusp of um, significant change with the potential for, well, rapid growth and development. It is. What kind of prices are we talking about for uh, homes in Bukasera? A three-bedroom home might cost somewhere between 35 million and 40 million francs. Okay. If you need a four-bedroom property, expect to pay up to 70 million francs. So still more affordable than uh, Kigali's premium areas, but definitely pricier than uh, Muhanga. Right. It seems like location and development play, well, a significant role in shaping those prices. What about Hugh? 
Huye offers a more um, budget-friendly option. Okay. You can rent a single room there for between 20,000 and 70,000 francs per month. Family homes typically cost around 200,000 francs per month in rent. Okay. If you're looking to buy, you could find a house for anywhere between 15 million and 40 million francs. So it seems like Rwanda's secondary cities offer a diverse range of housing options, each with its own um, unique appeal and price point. Yes. It's fascinating to see how these markets are uh, evolving and responding to different factors from tourism to, well, infrastructure development. It is. But what about the um, bigger picture? What does all of this tell us about the overall state of housing in Rwanda? It highlights the um, dynamic nature of the housing market in Rwanda, what? how it's adapting to the country's economic growth and the uh, changing needs of its population. Right. It also underscores the importance of understanding the nuances of, well, each region, each city, and even each neighborhood, as they all offer different opportunities and challenges. It's so like peeling back the layers of an onion. It is. Revealing the... Uh, complexity and interconnectedness of the factors that shake the uh, housing landscape. But I feel like we've only just begun to explore this topic. Mm -hmm. What are some other aspects of the housing market in Rwanda that we um, haven't touched upon yet? Well, we haven't talked about the role of brokers in the uh, rental market, right. the challenges of finding furnished versus unfurnished properties, okay. and the ongoing efforts to create more affordable housing options for uh, low-income earners. Yeah. These are all crucial elements of the bigger picture. It sounds like there's a lot more to uncover as we continue our um, deep dive into Rwanda's housing market. You know, one thing that stood out to me in the article was the discussion of furnished versus unfurnished properties. Oh, yeah. And it's not as straightforward as just adding furniture. Right. Oh. And the costs can vary, well, dramatically, depending on the neighborhood. Oh, you're right. I remember that section. Mm -hmm. Why does it make such a difference whether a place is um, furnished or not? Well, in those premium areas we talked about. The difference in cost between furnished and unfurnished is pretty small. Okay. Maybe around 10%. Got it. But in low-income neighborhoods, furnishing a place can actually increase the rent by 50% to 70%. Wow, that's a massive difference. So if you're on a tight budget, it's definitely worth the effort to uh, find your own furniture. Absolutely. But where would people even begin to furnish a home in Kigali? There are a few options. Okay. Some people bring their own furniture when they move. Mm-hmm which might be feasible if you're coming from, well, within Rwanda. Right. Others might inherit pieces from family or friends. Okay. And of course, there are secondhand markets and furniture stores. Sure. Yeah. Though the quality and price can be a uh, hit or miss. It sounds like furnishing a home in Kigali could be a whole adventure in itself, especially if you're trying to do it um, on a budget. It can be. Are there any uh, tips or tricks people should know about? It's definitely a good idea to, well, shop around and compare prices, mm -hmm. both in physical stores and online. Also, connecting with locals or uh, expat groups can be helpful for getting recommendations and finding, you know, hidden gems. That makes sense. Yeah. It's all about tapping into those local networks. Yeah. Speaking of navigating the housing market, yeah. the article mentioned that brokers play a significant role in uh, Kigali's rental market. They do. But how does it all actually work? Essentially, a broker acts as a middleman between, well, potential tenants and landlords. Right. They'll handle tasks like um, showing properties, mm -hmm. negotiating lease terms, right. and guiding both parties through the process. Got it. It can be helpful, especially if you're new to the city yeah. or unfamiliar with the local laws and customs. So they're like a facilitator. Exactly. Making sure everything runs smoothly. Right. But I imagine their services come at a price, right? They do. How much does it cost to... Uh, use a broker in Kigali? Their fee is typically based on the length of the lease. Okay. For a three-month lease, it's usually half a month's rent. Okay. If you're signing a year-long contract, yeah. the broker might charge a full month's rent. That's quite a hefty fee. <laughs> it seems like using a broker could add a significant chunk of change to your uh, housing expenses. It could. Is it always necessary to use one? Mm -hmm. Or are there situations where it might be better to uh, go it alone? That's a good question. Yeah. It really depends on your comfort level and your uh, knowledge of the market. Okay. If you're new to Kigali, a broker can be invaluable, providing guidance and saving you time and potential headaches. Yeah, that makes sense. But if you have local connections, are familiar with the areas you're interested in, mm -hmm. and are comfortable negotiating directly with landlords, 
right. you might be able to handle it yourself. So it's all about weighing the um, pros and cons. Right. Considering your budget and your uh, confidence in navigating the market. Yeah. It's fascinating to see how the housing market in Kigali mm -hmm. and really throughout Rwanda operates. It is dynamic. What's also fascinating is the articles focus on the uh, National Bank of Rwanda's efforts to discourage the use of U.S. dollars for renting high-end properties. Oh, right. Yes. We touched on this earlier. We did. But it's worth uh, delving into a bit deeper. Okay. Absolutely. That yeah. caught my attention, too. Why is this such a um, crucial issue? It comes down to stability and uh, fairness. Okay. Imagine you're a Rwandan earning in Rwandan francs. Yeah. And the rent for, let's say, a desirable apartment is quoted in U.S. dollars. Mm -hmm. Now, the exchange rate fluctuates, right? Of course. So your rent could essentially increase, well, overnight, yeah. making it even harder to afford. That sounds incredibly stressful. It can be. No wonder the uh, National Bank is trying to intervene. Right. It seems like it would create a lot of uncertainty and potential hardship for uh, renters. Exactly. Yeah. It creates instability for renters and can drive up housing costs even further. Right, yeah. By encouraging the use of Rwandan francs, the National Bank is trying to make things a bit more um, fair and predictable for everyone. Okay. It also helps protect the Rwandan franc yeah. and promote its use in the uh, local economy. It sounds like they're trying to ensure that the benefits of economic growth are distributed more um, equitably mm -hmm. and that everyone has a fair chance to access housing regardless of, you know, currency fluctuations. Yeah, yeah. It's a really interesting approach. It is. It makes me think back to that anecdote from the article about the uh, company director earning 60,000 francs a month in the 1980s. Right. A stark reminder of how much things have changed, both in terms of costs and the policies that um, shape the housing landscape. It's a testament to Rwanda's resilience and its uh, economic progress. Absolutely. While that progress has come with challenges like rising housing costs. Of course. It's also created opportunities for people to well, improve their lives. Right. It's all about finding that balance between um, economic development and social equity. Absolutely. Growth and progress need to be inclusive, ensuring that uh, everyone has a chance to thrive. Yeah. But with Kigali's rapid transformation, it seems like striking that balance is an um, ongoing challenge. It is. What are some other factors that might be impacting the housing market that we uh, haven't discussed yet? One key factor is the increasing demand for housing from a growing population. Oh. Kigali is a vibrant city attracting people from all over Rwanda and beyond. It is. This influx of residents puts pressure on the housing market. Yeah. Potentially leading to higher prices and competition for uh, available units. That makes sense. It's a classic uh, supply and demand scenario. Right. If more people want to live in Kigali than there are available homes, prices are bound to go up. Mm. Are there any um, initiatives in place to address this issue? The government is aware of this challenge. Okay. And is working on various initiatives to increase the supply of uh affordable housing. Great. These include encouraging the construction of new housing developments, mm. providing subsidies for low-income earners, right, and promoting innovative housing solutions like uh, micro apartments and shared living spaces. It sounds like they're exploring a range of approaches to tackle this um, complex issue. Yes. It's encouraging to see that they're recognizing the need for uh, affordable housing options and taking steps to address it. It is. But it also makes me wonder about the potential impact on the existing housing market. Mm. Could these uh, new developments or policies inadvertently drive up prices in other areas? That's a valid concern. Yeah. It's essential to carefully consider the uh, potential unintended consequences of any intervention in the housing market. Right. Striking a balance between increasing supply and maintaining affordability is crucial. Absolutely. It requires ongoing monitoring and, well, adjustments to ensure that the policies are having the um, desired effect. It seems like managing a city's housing market is a constant uh, balancing act. It is. Trying to meet the needs of a diverse population uh. while navigating the complexities of, well, economic growth and development. Exactly. It's a fascinating and challenging um, endeavor. It certainly is. And it's a reminder that housing is not just about bricks and mortar. Right. It's about people's lives, yeah. their aspirations, mm -hmm. their sense of belonging, yeah. and their ability to thrive in a city that's constantly evolving. Well said. It's yeah. about creating a city that works for everyone. Absolutely. Not just a select few. Right. But let's shift our focus back to those who are already um, 
living in Kigali. Okay. We've talked about the costs of, you know, buying or renting. Yeah. But what about the day-to-day -day expenses of maintaining a home? Mm -hmm. Are there any insights from the article about that? The article touches upon the costs of utilities, like uh, electricity, okay. water, right. and internet. Got it. These costs can vary depending on your usage and the type of property you live in. Yeah. For example, a larger villa with a swimming pool will naturally have higher utility bills than a uh, small apartment. That's a good point. It's easy to overlook those ongoing costs when you're focused on the um, initial price of buying or renting a place. For sure. Are there any uh, average figures we can share to give listeners a general idea of what to expect. Based on the article, a typical household in Kigali can expect to spend around 50,000 to 100,000 francs per month on utilities. Okay. Depending on their consumption habits and the size of their uh, dwelling. That's a helpful benchmark. It reminds us that housing costs extend beyond just the uh, rent or mortgage payments. Right. But let's not forget about the other expenses that come with living in a city like Kigali. Things like uh, transportation, groceries, and, well, entertainment. You're absolutely right. The cost of living encompasses so much more than just housing. Yeah. It's about factoring in all those uh, daily expenses to get a complete picture of what it takes to live comfortably in a particular city or um, neighborhood. And that cost of living can vary dramatically depending on your lifestyle, your needs, and your uh, priorities. Absolutely. It's about finding a place that aligns with your budget and your overall vision for how you want to uh, live. Exactly. It's about finding that sweet spot where you feel comfortable, financially secure, and connected to your uh, community. Speaking of community, I'm curious to hear more about the social dynamics of uh, Kigali's different neighborhoods. Okay. The article mentioned that these areas attract a mix of residents, mm -hmm. but how do those different uh, demographics interact. Mm -hmm. Is there a sense of community cohesion? Okay. Or are these neighborhoods becoming more uh, segregated along economic lines? That's a really important question. Yeah. The article doesn't delve too deeply into the uh, social dynamics. Right. But it hints at the potential for both integration and uh, segregation. Okay. Some neighborhoods, particularly those with mixed income housing, foster a sense of diversity and interaction among residents from, well, different backgrounds. Yeah. Others, particularly those with a higher concentration of wealth, might be more homogenous and uh, less integrated. It's a reminder that cities are not just collections of buildings. Right. They're uh, living, breathing ecosystems mm. shaped by the people who um, inhabit them. Yes. And understanding those social dynamics is right. crucial for creating a truly inclusive and uh, a vibrant urban environment. It's about fostering a sense of belonging for everyone. Right. Regardless of their income level, their background, or their uh, aspirations, yeah. it's about creating a city where people can connect, yeah. collaborate, right. and contribute to the um, collective well-being. It's about building a community, not just a city. Yeah. And that's a goal worth striving for, not just in Kigali, but in cities all around the uh, world. You know, it's fascinating to think about how Kigali's housing market is well, intertwined with the overall economic landscape of Rwanda, yeah. the growth of industries like uh, tourism, mm -hmm. technology, and agriculture, they all play a role in shaping, well, housing demand and affordability. Mm -hmm. It's like a ripple effect with changes in one sector influencing another. What's fascinating here is how those ripples extend beyond Kigali itself. Okay. The article highlighted the appeal of secondary cities like uh, Muhanga, right. Misanze, yeah. Bugesera, and Huye. Got it. Each of those cities offers a unique blend of, well, affordability, okay. lifestyle, mm -hmm. and opportunity, attracting residents and investors seeking alternatives to, you know, Kigali's bustling urban environment. It's almost like a microcosm of the uh, housing market diversity we see in Kigali. Right. But on a smaller scale, exactly. you've got everything from those budget-friendly rooms in Muhanga yeah. to those high-end vacation homes in Musanze. Right. It paints a picture of a country undergoing a um, dynamic shift with opportunities emerging beyond the capital city. If we connect this to the bigger picture, yeah. it speaks to Rwanda's efforts to uh, decentralize development. By promoting growth in secondary cities, the government aims to create more balanced economic opportunities across the country. Mm -hmm. Reducing reliance on Kigali right. and fostering more, well, inclusive growth. Which could, in turn, lead to more 
um, sustainable and equitable housing options for everyone. Exactly. It's like a chain reaction. It is. With positive impacts spreading outward from those uh, strategic investments. Right. But it also makes me wonder about the potential challenges these secondary cities might face as they uh, grow. That's a valid point. Yeah. It raises an important question. Can those cities maintain their affordability and, well, unique character as more people and businesses move in? Right. It's a delicate balance. Finding solutions will require careful planning. Yeah. And a commitment to um, sustainable development mm -hmm. that prioritizes the needs of existing residents while accommodating new growth. It's like walking a tightrope between uh, progress and preservation. It is. How do you encourage economic growth without sacrificing the qualities that make these secondary cities so um, appealing in the first place. That's the challenge. It's a challenge, well, many cities around the world are grappling with. For sure. It's about finding that sweet spot where development uh, enhances the quality of life for all residents, mm -hmm. not just a select few. Right. It requires thoughtful consideration of the long-term impacts of you know, growth, yes. ensuring that infrastructure, housing, and amenities, well, they keep pace with the influx of new residents and businesses. It seems like a, a multifaceted approach is needed. Yeah. One that addresses, well, economic, right, social, mm -hmm. and environmental considerations. Absolutely. What are some specific strategies that cities like Mahanga, Musanze, Bugazera, and Hue could implement to uh, manage growth sustainably? Well, investing in affordable housing projects that cater to the needs of a diverse population is crucial. Okay. This could involve providing subsidies for uh, low-income earners, I... promoting, well, mixed-income housing developments, mm. and encouraging innovative housing solutions like uh, micro-apartments and co-living spaces. That makes sense. Expanding the supply of um, affordable housing options would help alleviate pressure on the market. Yeah. And ensure that residents aren't, you know, priced out of their communities. Exactly. What other uh, strategies could be effective? Strengthening public transportation networks is another uh, key element. Okay. Efficient and affordable transportation options would connect residents to, well, job centers, mm. essential services, okay. and recreational opportunities. Yeah. Reducing reliance on private vehicles. Okay. And mitigating traffic congestion. That's a great point. Investing in public transportation not only improves um, mobility, yeah. but also promotes sustainability right. and reduces, well, environmental impact. It does. Are there any other areas that these cities should focus on? Protecting green spaces and promoting sustainable urban design principles are essential for preserving the quality of life as cities grow. Yeah. This could involve creating parks, <laughs> planting trees, right. developing uh, pedestrian-friendly streetscapes, okay. and incorporating energy-efficient building practices into you know, new construction projects. It's about creating cities that are not only um, functional and affordable, but also beautiful and livable. Absolutely. Places where residents feel a sense of connection to their surroundings yeah. and a sense of pride in their uh, community. Exactly. It's about creating a um, holistic vision for urban development. Right. One that integrates, well, economic growth, mm. social equity, yeah. and environmental sustainability. It's clear that Rwanda's housing market is a microcosm of the uh, larger challenges and opportunities facing cities around the world. It is. As populations grow, economies evolve, and technology you know, advances. Yeah. The way we design, build, and inhabit uh, urban spaces will continue to transform. And this deep dive into Kigali's housing market has provided us with valuable insights into the uh, complexities of that transformation. Uh, We've explored the different tiers of neighborhoods, yeah. the role of government policies, yeah. the impact of, well, tourism, right. and the challenges of uh, affordability. We've also witnessed the um, dynamic growth of secondary cities uh -huh. and the importance of sustainable development strategies that prioritize the well-being of all uh, residents. Absolutely. It's been a fascinating journey, revealing the intricate tapestry of factors that uh, shape the places we call home. Yeah, so as we conclude this deep dive, yeah. what stands out to you from all this information? For me, it's the reminder that cities are constantly evolving, adapting to uh, changing circumstances mm -hmm. and reflecting the aspirations of their um, inhabitants. Yeah, It's a process that requires constant vigilance, 
thoughtful planning, and a commitment to creating spaces that are not only well, functional, right. but, but also equitable, yes. sustainable, mm -hmm. and inspiring. Okay. I think that's a, a powerful takeaway. Yeah. Cities are not static entities, but, well, dynamic organisms that reflect the values and priorities of their um, residents. Absolutely. And as we move forward, yeah. it's essential to engage in thoughtful conversations about how we want our cities to uh, evolve, mm -hmm. ensuring that they provide opportunities for all who call them home. So to our listener, yes. as you continue to explore this topic, mm -hmm. perhaps you'll be inspired to look beyond the surface, yeah. to delve deeper into the um, stories behind the statistics, yeah. the people behind the properties, right. and the dreams behind the blueprints. Perhaps you'll even consider how you might contribute to a future where housing is not just a uh, commodity, yeah. but a fundamental right, mm. a place where everyone can feel a sense of belonging and uh, opportunity. Until next time. Yes. Keep exploring. Keep questioning. And keep diving deep. <laughs>